Merry Christmas. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Season's beatings, boys and girls. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Christmas Magazine. Uh, yeah. Volume 2, number 2, page 110. Whoa, whoa, 110? How did we get up to that? I don't remember how long the last story was, right? Oh, that's right. We're still recording it. <laughs> I am your host, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. That's the robotic assistant. Back on topic, guys. And Mary Announcer Man. I'd like to welcome you to our show. Tonight we've got a special episode. Now, is it fair to call it a special episode? Is it? Well, it's different than usual. I don't know if that makes it special unless you mean special. See the quotes I'm making in the air. I'm sure they all can. Okay, well, this is a special episode of <laughs> The Dune Steve. And today's story is The Spirit of Christmas by Rich Outfield. And Big Inklevich. Who is dead. Hey. About the author. The Rish author. Outfield is a loser. Big Anklevich cannot grow sideburns. Ah! You gave away my Achilles heel. Now everyone can defeat me. We've got a couple of awesome guest voices on today's episode. Yeah, we've got Norm Sherman, the man from the Drabblecast. The man. No, no yeah, further is need necessary. That. That's true. Liz Mirzievsky is uh, one of our faves, and she's here doing a voice as well as Julie Hoverson from 19 Nocturne Boulevard. She's back again as a voice in this podcast. Oh, this is much better. And we've got links to all their sites in the show notes. And the music on today's show is by Harry Larry, Jennifer Avalon, and Frozen Silence. Okay, no further procrastination. We will not spare you another moment from the torment that is the spirit. Oh, wait, it's not a scary story, is it? No. You'll know what I mean when you hear it about the torment. <laughs> Spirit of Crisp. The Spirit of Christmas by Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. The Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine presents a holiday story filled with magic and mundanity. So gather your ears together for what's sure to be a new holiday classic. Our story takes place in the midst of the Christmas season in the small, old-fashioned town of Hawk Creek. With the holidays right around the corner, everyone was doing their part. From Mayor Lynch and his corrupt cabinet, stringing lights above Main Street, to Audrey Hayward, practicing with her church choir group. From Frosty Bob, the snowplow driver, keeping the roads clean and safe, to WKOX, the local radio station, piping Christmas classics to everyone's ears. From the children, preparing their Santa Claus wishes, to Leland, the neighborhood homeless man, who while he didn't really contribute, was eager with a wave as the cars drove past on their way to work or school or drug counseling. Dale Cooper was just getting home from his job at the sewage treatment plant and noticed the plethora of lights and decorations that his neighbor, Benjamin Jacoby, had already begun hanging from his windows and drive and lawn and door and roof. Hey, Dale. Just getting home? Yeah, Benjamin. Uh, lots of calls today. That surprises me. But I guess toilets must flush, even in winter. That they do. What's that you got there? Oh, it's something I picked up at Horns. It's a big light-up arrow. What's it for? I'm going to stick it on the roof. Why? Well, it's like a air traffic sign. I'm going to point it at the chimney. You know, for Santa. Oh. Ben, your nose is pretty red. Don't you get it? It's a gag. Yeah, sure. 
Benjamin, it, it's pretty cold out. Your, your nose is getting red. You should feel my toes. I've been out here all afternoon. Gotta show my Christmas spirit. Well, I'd say you've got plenty. Enough for the both of us. I noticed you hadn't put any lights out yet. Still trying to make the Liebers feel less uncomfortable? Oh, I suppose we'll put some up soon. It's just been a little busy. You need to get into the spirit, Dale. I make it a point to buy extra lights and decorations in the big sale after Christmas, so I have more for the next year than I did the year before. It's a little late to let me know about that. I've got to get inside now. I think you missed dinner. I could smell your wife's cooking while I was out wrapping the reindeer. Well, uh, I'll go see if she saved me some. See ya. What you need to do is sit down and put on a nice Christmas movie. I saw Jim Carrey's Grinches on cable all month long. Yeah, I'm afraid we disconnected our cable box. Couldn't afford it, huh? Something like that. Hey, it's really chilly out. I'm gonna head in now. Well, I'm sure you'll warm up soon. We got Christmas with the Cranks on Blu-ray if you want to borrow that. Uh, no Blu-ray player. Thank goodness. You should get one. Way more lines of resolution, man. Uh, Ben, I'm, I'm gonna head in. Plus, Cranks was written by John Crisham, that lawyer guy. I, I saw the other one he made, where there's that law firm and they hire the young hotshot who thinks he can change the world. So the first thing he does is he gets out there and... Dale finally got inside and was greeted by his wife, Laura, who helped him with his coat. Wow, your hands are ice cold. You should see my cheeks. Maybe, if you're good. Daddy! Josie! Dale scooped up his seven-year-old daughter in his arms. His four-year-old son, Stuart, was in the living room, playing. Only 13 more days till Christmas, Daddy! Uh-oh, unlucky number. You better be extra good today, or Christmas might not come at all. You said that about Canada Day. Well, kiddo, just between you and me... Don't say it, Dale. Never mind. How you doing, Beef Stew? Ma. Stuart? He's playing with an eight chiver tree. Mommy put up all the decorations today. The what? The nativity. I told him we'd just put in a character a day, but when he saw the animals, he insisted they all go up, or the ones in the box would get lonely. Daddy, look at all the decorations. I helped hang the silver vines. Wow. Laura... You have totally decked the halls today. Dale looked around, seeing all that his wife had set up in the living room, foyer, and kitchen. Holiday lights, a festive tree, ornaments, garlands, Christmas cards, a hideous plate, a couple of presents, a nutcracker, the children's paper snowflakes, an advent calendar, a couple of blocks spelling out believe, holly and mistletoe, and brightly colored candles. I figured I'd get it all done in one day. It took hours. Wow, you've never gone all out like this before. Nope, but I really wanted to make the place sparkle this year. Doesn't it all look nice? Yes, very nice and very expensive. This is your cue to tell me they were a steal? That you got them secondhand? Or that they were on sale? A certain man once told me, when you see something you like, you have to go for it, no matter what it costs. And that certain man was trying to get your clothes off, honey. And if you ever want them off again, you'll stop asking about the price. Jeez, now I'm really worried. Dale looked around the room at the decorations and focused all his ire on a brown porcelain plate sitting on the mantel in a place of honor. What is that? It's a plate. The plate was a particularly ugly shade of brown, ostentatious and oversized. I can see that, but why is it on the wall? It's not on the wall. It's on the mantle. The plate was an eyesore. Did I mention it was brown? It had bright festive lettering on it, spelling out... The Spirit of Christmas. Well, I like it. The Spirit of Christmas? Yes. Kids... Come over here. Josie, what does that big brown plate say? The spirit of Christmas. It didn't sound any better coming from his daughter. Spirit of Christmas, huh? And what, pray tell, does that mean? It's like when you feel jolly and... Not you, Mom. What 
does a plate have to do with the spirit of... Nothing. Everything. I, I told you, I just liked it. But why doesn't it say feel the spirit of Christmas or share the spirit of Christmas or the spirit of Christmas is in the air? It just says... I know what it says, Dale. Well, I don't get it. Obviously. Well, I get it. I saw it in the curio shop and I just felt like there was something special about it. The only thing special is someone who would buy a plate like that. Am I special, Daddy? Uh, not in the way I'm referring to, kiddo. Dale tried to let it go. They chatted about little things, encouraged their daughter to get started on her homework, and put a lasagna in the oven to cook. As Dale set the table, he could spy the Spirit of Christmas plate all the way through the hall on the other side of the house. It was like a dent in a new car. A stain on a clean bedspread. A bad tooth on a pretty smile. A brown tooth. Look, honey. What? There's carolers out there. Carolers? What do carolers do? Do they go from house to house like trick-or-treaters? Or are we supposed to go to them? Apparently they just sing while they walk down the block. Huh. They're already gone. Was I supposed to tip them? That reminds me. You mind if I turn on WKOX? What? The radio. They're doing the 24-hour Christmas songs. Before Dale could stop her, his wife had turned on the radio. Oh, by golly, have a holly jolly Christmas this year. Jubilant music filled the air. Before long, Dale's young son came in and began to dance like St. Vitus by the table. That was Holly Jolly Christmas by Burl Ives. And now for your holiday enjoyment. Angels we have heard on high. The next day, all the children in town discovered a fresh blanket of snow covering everything. It was easy to get into the merry mood as Laura bundled her children up in their warmest winter gear and loaded them up into the car to head to school. Have a blow up frosty at that house. There are blow up Snoopy over there. And those guys have a blow up Mr. Hinky. The outfields has a blow up of a woman in front of their house. Ooh, look away, honey. At the corner, the Coopers saw Leland, the town's friendly homeless person. Look, it's houseless Leland. He looks so happy. Bye, Leland. He waved as the car drove past, and the kids waved too. Mommy, we need to go to the post office to mail my letter to Santa. I'll drop it off on my way home from school, hon. That afternoon, Dale took care of the kids while Laura went out for more Christmas shopping. Give me the ball, Stuart. My turn. Throw it back. No. Hey. No ball in the house, kids, or I'll take it away. Give it to me. It's mine. Come on, guys. I'll send you both to your rooms. The kids, of course, ignored Dale. They knew all his threats were empty ones. You can't get it. Yes, I can. But then... Dale turned his head just in time to see his wife's Christmas plate topple off the mantel and shatter all over the floor. Uh oh. Uh oh is right. We'll be back after these messages. From the makers of Barbie's Christmas Carol, Barbie the Nutcracker, Barbie Little Match Girl, and Barbie Three Musketeers, comes an all new animated special Barbie Die Hard. My boyfriend Ken and all of my friends are being held hostage in the Nakatomi building by a bunch of European terrorists. Uh, attention whoever you are, this channel is reserved for emergency calls only. Come on, lady. Does it sound like I'm ordering designer curtains for my dream house? Nine million terrorists in the world, and I gotta kill one with feet smaller than my sister Skipper. What's this? A note for you, boss. Now I have a machine gun. 
It matches my outfit. Ho, ho, ho. Wow, that Hans Gruber guy looks really upset. She's still alive. What? Who? My girlfriend. Only Barbie can do so much at one time and with trademark style. Don't lose hope, my friends. I'll get everybody out. I promise. I thought I told all of you. I want radio silence until further... Oh, I'm very sorry, Hans. I didn't get that message. Maybe you should have texted it to me. I thought I'd try and cheer you up. What with all your henchmen getting killed and all. That's very kind of you, young lady. You are most troublesome for a secretary. Sorry, Hans. Wrong guess. I've been a flight attendant, a veterinarian, a NASCAR driver, a runway model, even an astronaut. Fine, fine. I was also a safari tour guide, a doctor, a pilot, a cowgirl. Do you really think you have a chance against us, little cowgirl? yippee ki mother Barbie, die hard! Welcome to the party, pal. Now available on DVD and Blu-ray. And coming early next year. The tale of how one perky young woman made a difference in a time of great hardship. Barbie, there are 1,100 people who are alive because of you. I could have got more. There will be generations because of what you did. Barbie Schindler's List. This pink Corvette convertible? Ten people right there. Why did I keep this car? (laughs) These designer boots. This is real leather. Two more people. (laughs) This hat. Leopard skin. One more person. Okay. This belt. Half a person. Maybe one really short person. Barbie Schindler's List, on its way to your children's hearts next year. As if dropped from a building, the plate had been reduced to several sharp bits. Dale crossed the room to inspect the damage. There was no way of making the ugly plate look pretty again, It was a total loss. As he rose to grab the broom and clean the mess, he noticed the lights on the Christmas tree begin flickering and then go out. What now? Kids, clean that plate up. Be careful with the pieces. Dale couldn't figure out what was wrong with the tree lights. They wouldn't come back on. Heimer must have broken. Now I'm going to have to get a new one. Why does everything about Christmas have to cost so damn much? What, Daddy? Uh, Nothing, honey. Let's put that in the garbage, okay? At that moment... What's going on? Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. Well, can you help me with my bags? What did you buy, Mommy? You know, garlands for the medicine cabinet, fuzzy Christmas hats for Josie's class, snowflake pillowcases, tinsel for the icebox, a collar with the bells on it for the cat, stuff like that. Hearing that, Dale felt the hairs on his lower back stand on end, but then... I don't know why I bought so much stuff for the holidays. It all seemed necessary at the time, but now I'm sort of tempted to take it all back. Finally, she sees reason. I might return some of it, Dale. Maybe we have enough from what I bought last week. The new lights and the plate... Where's my plate? Uh... Kids, have you seen my plate? Uh... Where is my plate? Honey, there was a little accident while you were gone. It it, it sort of fell. What? Why? Why would you do this? We're sorry, Mommy. You did this on purpose. No, it was a total accident. And I had nothing to do with it. Oh. Honey, don't you think you're overreacting? Christmas is ruined. It's just a plate. Granted, an unethically expensive one, but just a plate. You don't understand. You never understand. Honey, what don't I understand? Leave me alone. Ah! (laughs) Uh Uh-oh, Mommy. 
she's mad. No, dummy, she's sad. Daddy, she called me a dummy. Well, you are. Hey, cut it out, guys. Don't worry. She'll be okay. You'll see. But Dale was wrong. She wouldn't be okay. And neither would anyone else. But I have a blue, 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 blue Christmas. That was Blue Christmas by Elvis Presley. <sighs> Up next is... Uh, uh, great. The Little Drummer Boy by Neil Diamond. Hey, kids, what's the deal? It's Saturday. Why are you just sitting around like a couple of pigeons? Pigeons don't sit. Okay, uh, like a couple of lumps of coal then. There's still snow outside. You guys want to go out and make a snowman or something? Nah. Mr. Jacoby next door used his welding thing to melt the last snowman we made yesterday. It's dumb to make another one. Okay. Well, it's Christmas time. What about a Christmas special? I heard that they were playing the Charlie Brown one. You remember that, right? Yeah. Where's the remote? Ah. Do you really think he'll come? Tonight the great pumpkin rises out of the pumpkin patch. Here you go. That's not white. Yes, it is. Look, there's Linus. See, he's waiting in the pumpkin patch. What the heck? I must have put the wrong one on by accident. Let's see what the guide says. Really? The great pumpkin? Confused, Dale changed the channel. Where one station had promised to play It's a Wonderful Life, they were now showing Predator. Instead of a Christmas story all day long, TBS was now planning to offer mud wrestling. Most alarmingly, the only actual Christmas program on anyone's schedule was the Star Wars Holiday Special. A day of harmony. Ew. Well, kids, uh, I've had enough of this moping around. Let's go shopping. Uh. Hey, honey, I'm taking the kids Christmas shopping. You want to come? When Laura appeared from the back room, Dale gasped <gasps> to see the sight of her. Dressed all in black, no makeup, oversized Joni Loves Chachi sweatshirt, hair all in a ponytail, as if she were in mourning for her plate. Christmas shopping? What's the point? You're not still upset about the accident, are you? What? Oh no, I just, I just don't feel like doing any of that stuff anymore. Any of what stuff? All that stuff you complained about all month long. Whoa, don't join my side. Come to the store with us. That'll cheer you up. There's nothing like shopping to bring out that light in your eyes. The four stumbled out the door towards the car. But as soon as they got inside, Dale realized that something was very wrong. The menagerie of plastic reindeer and blow-up snow globes that just yesterday made his neighbor Benjamin's lawn look like the small world ride from Disneyland was gone. In its place was nothing more than the rapidly melting gray snow. Sure is warm out today. Maybe I don't need my coat after all. As the others piled into the car, Dale wondered what could have happened. He noticed that the Yorks down the street had removed their lights from the roofline and windows... In fact, it seemed like everyone had, except for Ron Dolan. Oh, no, there he was, coming around the corner with his ladder and pulling the light strings down one by one. Now only the Liebers had decorations up, a big, light-up menorah. It was very strange. <sighs> then he saw him, sitting on a lawn chair, listless and unkempt, wearing nothing but his long johns, was Dale's ever-cheerful neighbor, Benjamin Jacoby. His holiday cheer was as noticeably absent as his pants. Benjamin? Are you okay? Uh, ben, have you been drinking? Not enough. Has something happened? Nope. Nothing at all. That's the point. What do you m I wasted my life, Dale. This world is a cesspool, a clogged septic tank. 
Uh, but no offense to your job. And I didn't realize until now that I'm up to my knees in it. This doesn't sound like you. You love Christmas more than anybody I know. Well, except maybe Laura. Dale glanced over to his car and saw Laura with a melancholy expression on her face. A familiar expression. Well, we're going to hit the mall. Maybe pick up a gift or two. I, uh, I'll bet you've already got all your Christmas shopping done, don't you? Yes. I stupidly thought I could get it all done in the fall and miss the crowds. Now I'm going to have to stand in lines anyway. I, I don't get it. To return it all. Well, when uh, I when when I get back, you can uh, put on some pants and we'll talk about it, okay? Maybe over a glass of your world famous eggnog. In the toilet, I dumped it. Oh, okay. I I'll see you later, Benjamin. Dale walked to the car, stunned. He climbed in and started the engine. When the radio came on, he breathed a sigh of relief. At least WKOX was still spinning their endless parade of Christmas tunes. They'd been playing them 24 hours a day since the day after Halloween, so it would take a tsunami to put a halt to their playlist. Holiday cheer hadn't completely evaporated with the rising temperatures. I don't know about you, but I've had quite enough of this Christmas rubbish. Up next is Creeping Death by Metallica. Dale snapped the radio off, leaving the car in uncomfortable silence. Something strange had happened. Somehow, overnight, he, Dale Cooper, was the only one left with any Christmas spirit. And he never had much to begin with. Okay, kids, let's hit the road. Seatbelts, please. Dale wasn't a Scrooge, but he'd never understood his wife's fascination with the holiday season. He always went along with what everyone else was doing because, well, it was easier the thing to do. But now, with everything gone wrong, he realized for the first time how much he missed the cheerful presence of Christmas. The thermometer outside the studio says it's 60 degrees. I've no idea what that means since I only speak Celsius, but it's too bloody warm. Next on WKOX, we have... You know what? I'm going to go take a slash. At the store, the Salvation Army bell ringer was still in his customary place, but... Wait, what are you doing? I told you, I gave you a donation yesterday. I want it back. Hey, you can't do that, sir. It was my quarter. I want it back. Give it to me. Hey, to me hey stop. Oh, hey, stop, please. Oh, it was I... right for your mom. Oh, oh, now look what you've done. Dale dragged his desultory family into the mall and did a double take. If he'd been drinking something, he'd have done a spit take. The holiday decor was gone. They'd put it up before they'd even taken down the pumpkins and sold off the costumes at half price. Yet here it was, still a week from Christmas, and they'd completely undecked the halls. The Christmas trees and wicker reindeer were boxed up. The bows and silver balls that hung from the ceiling advertising 50% off sales had vanished, and the whole lot of holiday Barbie dolls were in the trash can. I don't believe this. What? The manager of Weeby Toys said they'd stopped taking donations for Toys for Tots, and everything they'd gathered so far was to be sold on eBay. Was he joking? Nobody's in a joking mood right now, Dale. Kids, do you still want to go shopping? Mm-hmm. Sure. See, honey? Two important people still have the holiday spirit. If Christmas is canceled, then I can spend my present money on myself, right? I want candy! Kids... Let's head back to the car. All around, things had changed, and they weren't getting better. The blue of Frosty's gone. Snoopy's gone, too. Even the Mr. Hinky's gone. The outfield's blow up woman is still there. Look away, kids. Oh, here comes Leland's corner. Get ready to wave, kids. I don't see him. Where is he? Is that a sweet sticking out of that snowdrift? Is he dead, Mommy? No, Stuart, I'm sure he's fine. I think he is dead. We better call 911. 
Yes, even Leland, the friendly homeless man, couldn't escape the malaise that was eating at the town of Hawk Creek. As the coroners took away his filthy, stiffening body, the unease that had been growing inside Dale reached a screaming crescendo. What could have caused such a ubiquitous surge of apathy to come over everyone? Come on, honey, let's go home. Too bad about Leland, huh? I guess. It's not like anybody's going to miss him. Whoa, did you really just say that, honey? I can't believe you. Whatever. I don't care. What the hell is going on? Arriving home, they found that their neighbor, Benjamin, hadn't stirred from the place where they'd left him. Several more empty bottles sat around his feet, however. Laura took the kids inside, and Dale went over to speak with Benjamin again. So, Ben, you feeling any different? Uh, I didn't make it to the bathroom, so I'm feeling a little moist. Is that what you mean? Dale looked around Benjamin's yard and saw a charred plastic shape over by the dripping gutters. It looked like it had once been a Christmas tree, decorations and all. What happened to your tree? I torched it with my arc welder. Wow! I'll bet there's a story behind an accident like that, huh? It was no accident, Dale. What would motivate you to do a thing like that? I don't know. What would motivate me to spend $600 on a tree and decorations? That's what I don't get, Ben. I don't know anyone who has more holiday cheer than you. Unless maybe it's Laura. And I think you even had her beat. What happened? What changed? Well, if there's such a thing as a spirit of Christmas, it's haunting some other house right now. Hmm. You know, that's funny. My wife bought this stupid plate that said the spirit of Christmas on it. The kids accidentally broke it the other day, and since then, Laura has been all sad and gloomy about Christmas, too. You don't say. Yeah. And and it was an ugly plate, too. It didn't have a picture of a sleigh or Santa on it or anything. It was just a brown plate that said the spirit of Christmas on it and nothing more. Fascinating. Yeah. Weird, huh? I remember when I first saw it thinking, why does it say that? What, is this plate supposed to be the spirit of Christmas? Can you think of a lamer... There stood Dale, thunderstruck on his neighbor's porch. As listless as Benjamin was, even he began to feel uncomfortable with Dale standing there before him, silently, his eyes darting back and forth as his mind churned through the possibility... It wasn't until he heard a shattering sound across the street that he broke from his reverie. Two children were pelting a neighborhood cat with the glass ornaments from their Christmas tree. Sorry, Benjamin. Gotta go. And don't you worry, I'm gonna make this right. Dale strode purposefully to his house. On his front porch, he found his daughter, Josie, watching the kids torment the cat with a disgusted look on her face. Dale stopped for a moment to praise her. Josie, I'm I'm proud of you for not doing that kind of thing. Yeah... Mike and Cortland came over and invited me to join them, but they wouldn't share. And our ornaments are plastic. That's no fun. Hmm. Well, come inside with me. I need to talk to you about something. Inside, he found his little son, Stuart, up to something as well. There on the top of the piano was the set of blocks that spelled out the word believe. Stuart was artfully rearranging them. He split the blocks in half, shuffling the letters until they spelled the phrase, Be Evil. Stuart, what would your mother say if she saw that? Oh, I'm sorry, Daddy. Stuart went to work stitching the letters again, but he didn't change them back. He made them spell out, Be Vile, instead. Is that better? Uh, no. You know, a word like vile is a little unnerving, in fact. What? You know what? Forget it. it. It's not your fault. Josie, Stuart, come here. You remember that plate that Mommy had? You mean the one that Josie broke did? Nuh-uh, Stuart broke it. Hey, cut it out. It's fine, I don't care who broke it. I just want to know what you did with the pieces after I told you to clean it up. I sweep them up and put them in the garbage can in the living room. With hope blooming in his eyes, Dale rushed to the living room trash, grabbed the can, and upended it onto the coffee table. A moldy old apple core, five double bubble wrappers, a wadded up bag from the dollar store, and several pieces of broken crockery spilled out. Dale shoved the extra garbage back into the can, but not before Stuart could notice that one of the double bubble wrappers still had gum in it. Hey, gum! 
Ew, Daddy! Stuart just put that piece of gum from the garbage in his mouth. Uh, that's fine, Josie. Listen, I need your help. It can be like putting together a puzzle. We've got to get this plate back together. Start looking for pieces that fit together, and, and I'll get the super glue. Hey, honey, uh, can you come help me with something? It was a long and arduous process. Dale was right. It was just like a puzzle. Like a 1,000-piece 3D puzzle. It took the entirety of their combined mental capacity to reassemble those shards, as well as a liberal amount of nail polish remover to get Stuart's fingernails apart again after he'd glued them together. Twice. When they were finished, the plate looked almost nothing like it originally had. Before, it had been ugly, brown, and kitschy. Now, it was sad, mutilated, creased, and hideous. But it was whole once again. Any minute now, the spirit of Christmas would return, and December could go on as it should. So doing this is supposed to make me feel better about Christmas? I sure hope so, honey. I don't feel any different, Dale. Kids, how about we sing the one about good King Wenceslas? How about no? Get bent. Then, suddenly, Dale did hear a sound ringing over the snow. It started in low, and then started to grow. Carolers! The carolers were out again. He had saved Christmas after all. Dale dashed to the window and threw up the blinds. The same group of carolers from the other day was strolling through the street, singing. He didn't recognize the song. He was pretty sure they were singing something like, I won't be home for Christmas, but they were caroling, and that's all that mattered. But just as suddenly, the carolers scattered in a disorderly stampede as his neighbor, Benjamin, turned his water hose on the group. He cackled madly as he watched the shocked and moistened (laughs) singers retreat. Enjoying the balmy weather, you (laughs) bloodsuckers! Well, at least he's gotten over being so lethargic. Suppose this isn't really better, though. Dale, I appreciate you making an effort with the plate, but it was a lost cause. Just like me. Don't talk like that. A lot of people get depressed around the holidays. We'll snap you out of it, right, kids? Meh. Josie, you were pestering Mom the other day about baking cookies for Santa. Maybe that could be a good activity for the family. Can we eat the cookies? Well... One or two? What do you say, Laura? I guess. The mix is just sitting there. Joes, what kind of cookie do you think Santa would like? Mom, I think we should have a little talk. About Santa? About Santa. Dale's breath caught in his throat. Um, Stuart, let's go downstairs and see if we can't find, um, something to do, uh, down there. We can check the mouth chat. Okay. Once Dale and his son were gone... All right, kiddo. Do you really think we should let a strange man into our house in the middle of the night? Especially when you and Daddy are sleeping. Oh. It seems not very responsible to me. The next day, Josie's letter to Santa Claus came back to the Coopers. It was marked, Return to Sender. The daily newspaper headline read, Decorations Down, Murder Rate Up. While I'm not playing any more sodding Christmas music, I have to fill up my airtime with something. So here's a list of people I hope rot in hell. Starting with that Will Ferrell fellow, why hasn't he had an embolism yet? Dale had been fighting despair all day and all night. It was almost a physical weight on his shoulders. This sickness that had overtaken his town ran deep, much deeper than a mere broken plate. Dale chuckled at the absurdity of the idea of a magic dish that had caused all this. Clearly, his desperation had fogged his thought process. How could a plate be the spirit of Christmas? It was ludicrous. What insanity had gripped him to make him believe that such a thing could be? Finally, he sat down on the couch and sighed. (sighs) Afraid it would turn into weeping at any moment. But then... What? His gaze went to the far wall, the empty spot on the mantel, the piano and the bottom of the piano, for some reason. There, among the dust bunnies and moldering honey nut Cheerios, was a little brown lump. Dale rose. He crossed the room, and getting down on his hands and knees, examined the lump. It looked like... He was pretty sure it was. Yes, it was a piece of the broken plate. We missed one. 
Quickly, Dale went to the drawer and removed the glue and the poorly reassembled dish. He found the remaining chipped spot where the missing piece went and inserted it. Poof! The plate was complete. Dale? Hey, Dale! What is it? The television just interrupted their mud wrestling marathon. They're showing Christmas movies again. Are they? Well, it's that awful one about Santa being abducted by Martians, but it beats heavyweight mud wrestling. Or Will Ferrell and Elf. And on the news report, they said it's supposed to start snowing any time tonight. Yay, snowflakes! I think it just did. I guess somebody somewhere got their spirit of Christmas back. Honey, as far as I'm concerned, the spirit of Christmas is you. Things were back to relative normal in the Cooper household, and all around the rest of Hawk Creek as well. Lights went back on, trees went back up, and presents started to wrap themselves up again. I I mean, people started wrapping the presents. That was (laughs) poorly worded. This isn't supposed to be a creepy story. I mean, it's not like the presents started to get up and wrap themselves. That would be pretty frightening, don't you think? Um, anyway... Dale looked around, feeling the festive atmosphere surrounding him, returning at last, like Amy Winehouse to a crack file. Um, perhaps that wasn't the best simile I could have used. I was going to say, returning like Angelina Jolie to the adoption agency, but I made an editorial decision. I I see now it was probably the wrong one. Let's, uh, just continue with the story, shall we? The holiday spirit had infected everyone. Not quite the way it had before, but still in a fresh and unpredictable way, like the first snowstorm of the season. Laura was going through their basement, looking for coats to donate to the Coats for Kids drive. Josie was eating the chocolates from her advent calendar for all the days she'd skipped during the funk. And Stuart was playing with the nativity scene and his action figures, posing them to protect the baby Jesus from Cobra and the Decepticons. Let's plug in that Christmas tree, huh, kids? Oh, I forgot to tell you, there's something wrong with one of the lights. Christmas light! Yay! Wrong with what? Nothing. They look fine to me. I'm sorry about what I said about Santa, Mommy. Let's make him some chocolate chip cookies, okay? Uh, no chocolate chips. How about raisins, then? Look, Daddy, Mr. Jacoby's in our front yard. Uh Uh-oh. No, Dale, he's building another snowman. Oh, even bigger one that we made! And he's wearing pants! Dale put his arms around his family and smiled big. Before long, the carolers came by once again, and the Coopers put on their galoshes and scarves and went out to join them. Silent night, holy night. I'm feeling a lot better about going Christmas shopping, Dale. It's good to hear. Right. I'm sure you mean that. The thing is, for some reason, I do. I am child. Holy And my ex-husband. He's living proof that some humans evolved from the weasel. And let's see. Who else do I hate? I... I... Wait a tick. I'm sorry, I completely forgot about the Christmas song marathon. I'd say it's right time to get back to it, wouldn't you? So, we pick up our holiday music marathon exactly where we left off. Um, ah, yes, a new Xmas classic, Happy Holidays, You Bastard, by Blink-182. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. All right. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your ride. You know, I hope they enjoyed the story. I'm not sure if I did or not. You don't think so, huh? Author's note. <laughs> oh, yeah. We should do an author's uh, note of some sort. No, well, just this part of the episode is our author's note, right? Pretty much, yeah. We can talk about uh, the whole process. Heck, it was, I mean, we're recording this episode like a week before it's coming out, which is actually a lot closer than what we usually record our episodes. We usually record our episodes and then they sit moldering for a month before they actually get onto the show. But 
of course, we collaborated together to create this story. And knowing the way that the two of us both write, it's no surprise that we finished it at the last possible minute. If we hadn't finished it today, and we did finish, we actually went through the story for the final pass, and then turned around and read the entire thing into the mic. So yeah, it's as last minute as it could possibly get. Unless, of course, this is January you're hearing this. then <laughs> They probably are hearing it in January. It's not like very many people listen to podcasts the day they come out. I mean, that's the thing about podcasts. You can listen to it when you want to. You don't have to tune in next week. You just download it and listen to it when you have time. And, of course, I'm sure we released our Christmas episode too close to Christmas for anybody to listen to it before Christmas was over. But that happened last year, too, I think. So, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't think it was 100% my fault this time because we were supposed to get together last week and yeah, do all of this that. happy crap. Wait, we weren't even remotely close to done last week at this True. time. True. Just- oh, no, no. What we're supposed to do last week was just pound it out and work whether it was until 5 a.m. and get it done <laughs> so that we would had weeks to send it to Norm, to send it to Liz and get it all ready to go. But we didn't even get together last week. Yeah, my parents happened to be in town and it just made it too difficult owing to the fact that we record generally uh, until three in the morning it's 1 45 a.m right now and uh my parents they have a tendency to like to sleep and sometimes they get grumpy as we're up here yelling all night long in the room that's directly above the room that they sleep in so here we are at the very last minute so big do you care to explain the genesis of this little story sure i'd love to It's loosely based on me and my family. The plate that is the centerpiece of the story is an actual plate that my wife actually came home with one day. And I looked at that thing and I said, what in the freak is that? It's useless. She put it up there on the uh, mantle and said, oh, this is wonderful. I love this plate. And I couldn't understand it. It just said the spirit of Christmas on it. What, is that plate the spirit of Christmas? It's one of the things that first came to my mind. And of course, that started the wheels in my head a turning. And uh, I came up with sort of an idea of, hey, what if this plate was the spirit of Christmas? And the first thing Rish and I thought to do, of course, was to make a short film about this where we uh, had my kids and they're playing and they break the plate and we, you know, make this whole thing about how we were going to go out and you know record a street where the christmas lights all turn off and you know here's the spirit of christmas going away and for a long time we kind of had that idea in the scrap heap because we figured it's got to be a film and we're never going to get around to making the film all the jokes that we came up with were visual jokes it seemed so writing a short story about it didn't seem like the right way to go and the other thing that also kind of killed the film ideas that i mentioned the idea of us making a movie where we break the plate and my wife put her foot down right then and there and said no you will not break my plate yeah it eventually just kind of died see i wrote up a treatment for it years ago back when i was still naive enough to think that you and i would make films and uh, yeah that treatment you could write your name in the dust on it. <laughs> or you could have. Not anymore. Yeah. So we brushed it off. And- you came up with the new idea, the new way to basically go with it. Just, what, like a few months ago, you're like, hey, I was thinking, what if for Christmas episode we put together kind of an audio drama of that thing? At least then we could still get away with some of our audio jokes. Like the, uh, you know, Creeping Death being the next song to be played after the Christmas song marathon ends. That's right. Now, now there's a real English DJ, (laughs) right? Now, what she's doing out here, I have no idea. But I remember you saying, and and correct me if I... Don't correct me if I'm wrong. It makes for a better story. That you were going to track her down and get her to record the Creeping Death intro. (laughs) I actually was planning on doing that. I was figuring that... I know somebody who knows that woman that was the English DJ and that was the one that inspired this character. She's long dead by now, I'm sure. Probably, yeah. It's been a long time. And part of the problem is that we tried to make a film when I first moved here and we got together (laughs) and it was so easy. We weren't even really going to be in it. It was just going to be the kids. I was going to get my sister's kid to participate. And yeah, we got them all together and shot this footage and uh, right there next to the treatment, it moldered. (laughs) 
Yeah, I've actually got the whole thing probably 90% edited and sitting on my computer. And it's been taking up, you know, 20 or 30 gigabytes of space on my computer for the last four years. Because it was a Halloween movie that we did. Every year as Halloween rolls around again, I'm just like, oh, I ought to finish that. And of course, I never do. And then I don't think about it again until September at least of the next year. Now, I, he is exaggerating. I mean, it's, don't don't think we're that big of losers. It hasn't been four years. Three years, it's been. The interesting thing about this, I guess, is that we managed to collaborate for once. This is the first thing that we've got past the first stages of saying, hey, we should collaborate on something. What do you think we should write? I don't know. And that's usually about as far as we get. And this time around, we actually did it. We tried a couple of different things. First of all, you wrote up a treatment and maybe a couple of lines and you sent it to me and said, okay, write something on this. And of course, months went by and I did nothing. No way. So then you're like, okay, well, I really need to do something. And you wrote a bunch more on it and then sent it to me. Said, what do you think of this? And the plan was, I think it was a couple weeks ago, where we were going to get together and one of us was going to sit and type while the other one of us says, oh, we could do this and we could do that. And the one's supposed to be writing. And that didn't really go anywhere either. I, I think we found other things to do. We're like, oh, don't we need to record a promo for that one thing that's going to happen next June? For and that so, pseudopod episode that's never going to air? <laughs> right. Anything that would keep us from sitting down and actually writing on that story. Last week was supposed to be the last ditch. You know, we were going to do it. And uh, yeah, then my parents showed up, so that wasn't going to happen. But as I was about to go to bed, you said, hey, why don't we just talk right now and do it? And so we actually got together on Skype and talked a little bit about it. And you typed some stuff up. And we probably only wrote like one scene that way, I think, before we were like, yeah, it's taken way longer than I thought it would so it's we, really hard to write on the fly now anybody who's a writer knows and anybody who's ever listened to this show knows because i say the same thing week after week it is hard to write and it takes so much more time than you ever think that it will <laughs> yeah. and i i had this collaboration experience a month ago that was just god awful yeah it was just like somebody would give me all their ideas for for writing and then i was supposed to go out and make it work and write it and then he had the audacity to say that I had done nothing. Wow. Considering you spent 15 minutes and I spent five hours, I guess I did do nothing. Sorry, bitter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's how it was that night. And so I think your idea was you got to the end of the day to write or to, well, to the end of tomorrow and then send it to me and I'll have that day to write till the end of that day. And then I'll send it back to you and we'll do ping pong. And I knew we wouldn't. And we wouldn't have an episode for Christmas, and that's life. <laughs> but for some crazy reason, at the last minute, you got all into it. And by this point, I was just bitter and just unhappy. <laughs> and you'd email me, and my response would be one word, and it was die. <laughs> How did it happen? How did you get all infused with the spirit of Christmas? I don't know. I mentioned that idea to you and you were like, well, it's fine. I have to admit that on my day, I may just write the whole thing because I'm really worried about getting this thing done in time. And I think maybe it was that comment that made me finally feel like, yeah, maybe I better the old college try at least. And, and somehow I managed to put a little bit of time into it, even though I didn't have time to do. I, I still, you know, I just ignored my work, ignored my kids and ignored my wife and so forth and just went ahead and did it. And uh, big, you're crazy. You know, it still was probably at least 60 percent written by you, if not more, but at least put in a decent share of, of work and it managed to get finished which is better than usual <laughs> yeah cheers guys <laughs> I, that's something we always talk about besides me talking about how hard it is to write we talk about collaboration and wouldn't it be cool if we do this and how do people collaborate and why does it not work for us but now we have a positive experience i thought it was positive yeah. i mean ultimately it's done oh wait you still have to edit the damn thing <laughs> all the hard work for me is done except for editing out the profanity in this episode we're doing right now i don't have to do anything else except for just lean back and listen to how it comes together and so usually it's just the whole childbirth thing. Once it's behind you, you're able to look back and smile and go, wow, you know, isn't life beautiful? And you don't think of viscera and placenta and mucus pain. and pain. I don't know. It actually makes me feel like we ought to give it a shot again. 
try a short story instead of a radio play script like we did with this one and see what we can do with that. It might be fun to do. It, it seems like that whole system that we did kind of worked where we just like ping ponged it back and forth. One day you have every other day is your day to write. So at the very least, you get a day off. But you can go, ah, Tuesday. That's not my day. And I think you sort of hit the nail on the head. One of the secrets was knowing that if you don't put in your share, the other person is going to do it. And yeah, for me, that's the motivating factor. You know what I mean? Where it's like, well, hey, I want to feel like I contributed to this. You know, it's like I I want my jokes to get in here and my character names are all from Twitter to get in here because if i don't he's gonna write this scene that i really want to write and all that and i i don't know that motivated me i enjoyed that i was surprised you know it's like page after page had come in from you and it's like oh crap so maybe arrogance pride <laughs> friendly competition whatever you want to call it is yeah there. it's like we spoke way back when we did our broken mirror uh, event about how i challenged you to write a story based on the same premise that I'd already come up with. I already had a story in my head for this premise and I just couldn't motivate myself to actually do that. And I basically used you as my motivation. I said, what if we both write this story? And so you actually wrote the entire story and emailed it to me before I'd even done the first word on my story. And it was that same kind of thing. I was like, oh, crap. Now I've got to write my story because he did his part. So now I have to do my part. Well, kind of what, what is thing. the word we're looking for? What is that? Is it guilt? It might be, especially considering that I challenged you to do that and then I still didn't do my part and you did. But guilt is a good motivator in the end. It's not a completely negative thing. Managed to make uh, our episode come out, so there's some good that can be said about guilt. And yeah, this is our second year in a row with Norm Sherman narrating a story. I guess he read the whole one last year. Yeah. I had nothing to do with that. In fact, I did. I did shit, have a. But... I did have a girl do the girl voices, and somehow deleted her audio track. So You're he, kidding me? <laughs> so he did wind up reading the whole story. But I did have a plan to make it all spiffy. You accidentally deleted them. Yeah, I did. I deleted the whole thing, and I was like, "Oh, bleep, bleep." But it was easier that way, you know. I had Norm's finished story, and I just could put it out as is instead of have to go through and try and edit in all the lines that she read. So, you know, it saved me a little time, I guess. That's true. We did give him slightly more warning this time than last year. Yeah, probably, but not a lot. Maybe three days more warning than last time. Well, hey, that that reminds me. I don't think we've ever talked about it, but Julie Hoverson, she has this amazing talent to record her parts immediately and get them back to us. Like within an hour of you sending the request. And I don't know how that is possible. Unless maybe she's in a cell and she can't get away from her computer. I think it's awesome. But you and I will get together for four or five hours on a Monday night. And I've seen you send her an email saying, okay, hey, we need you to do this. And then a few minutes later, we get an email and it's like attached. Yeah, it it saves our bacon all the time because we're always so last minute. that. Oh, and uh, and she, she's got a podcast herself. Right. Julie does. And she said... That she, dude, this is just sickening, dude. In a good way, but sickening nonetheless. That she records her her tracks six or seven months ahead of time. (laughs) So that she's just got all this time to edit and play and and make changes and all that. And I was just like, six or seven, I don't know if I'm going to be alive six or seven months from now. You won't. Let alone podcasting. Did you hear that? It's the scariest thing ever. I heard a voice. Well, I won't even repeat what it said because it's just too scary. (laughs) But yeah, she does. She has a really great podcast. Hers is similar to ours, but a little different as well because she does audio drama. Wait, what did we do? You, well, this the, today's show was what you could call probably audio drama, although I don't know. Not a lot of drama in tonight's episode. <laughs> True enough. I think a lot of audio dramas, you may not be allowed to have a narrator. But uh, yeah, she does audio dramas over on her podcast, 19 Nocturne Boulevard, it's called. We do dramatized short stories, I guess you could say. They're on the way toward audio drama, but we don't take that step and knock out all the description and so forth that people write when they write prose and turn it into more like a play. Yeah, that was what saved us on this one was deciding to turn the narrator into a character Mm -hmm. who just talks and 
he doesn't really participate in the story, but he has a personality and yeah. just reads tons of exposition because without it, it wouldn't have made any sense. It would have been really difficult to pull off. Without the narrator, a lot of the jokes would have been impossible to get across. We just needed him to say, oh, yes, and the newspaper headline says, decorations down, murders up. You can't really show that in an audio story. I don't know how I, you... I, I think the line was pimps down, hose up. What did he say? Oh, he must have got that wrong then. So anyways, yeah, Julie did a great job, and she doesn't only come over to our podcast to help us out. She actually had us go over to her podcast and help her out a little bit. Oh, hell no, Big Angry Bitch! Indeed she did. We actually helped her out on her Christmas episode as well, which came out uh, uh, like a couple weeks ago. It came out in April, folks. (laughs) It was finished in April and then came out uh, right on time, unlike ours, which of course came out too late to listen to before Christmas was over. So the uh, episode that we did for her was called The Gift of the Zombi, which is, of course, you know, loosely based on the Gift of the Magi. But, of course, this is zombies involved in this. And, and Rish and I got to do the voices of some zombies, had ourselves a really good time, to tell you the truth, because the whole story was zombies talking... And then you got to hear like the, a voiceover doing what the zombies are really saying. So it was, hey, hi. And it was, hi there, how are you? And now you have heard the episode and I haven't. But I, of course I will fix that as soon as I go home. <laughs> is it always horror or is it always uh, – with a name like 19 Nocturne Boulevard, that sounds ominous. I don't think it's always horror, but they do do their share of it. They've had uh, a story that they did for Halloween, or at least in October, that was Dracula.com, I believe they called it. And it was, uh, you know, the original Dracula story was kind of told through letters and... Epistolary format, my friend. Yes. And so they went ahead and updated that epistolary format. My friend. told it through uh, emails and... Facebook posts and crap like that, (laughs) which, uh, you know, changes the story around a little bit, but still makes it fun. I've actually been told that coming up, and this, of course, will be a while before it actually hits, because like we said before, uh, she's got her stuff ready six months in advance at least. But uh, she's planning on doing a audio drama of a story that ran here on the Doonstie first. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, you don't say. But yeah, she's actually going to be doing a, a, a audio drama of Chemo, the Town of Golden Woods that uh, we ran back on our uh, Broken Mirror episode. She uh, enjoyed that story uh, enough to want to do it herself. So there's that to look forward to. But this month's episode, their Christmas episode, is The Gift of the Zombie. So you can go over and check that out. We've got small parts in it, but uh, uh, it's a fun episode. And, uh, yeah, we've actually got a a promo for 19 Nocturne Boulevard that we'd like to play. Hit it! This is 911. What is the nature of your emergency? I've been robbed! Please list the items in question. My latte is only a single! You're calling from a cell phone, aren't you? Yes. In your car? Yes. And there's definitely not a dollar fifty worth of sprinkles on top! They totally ripped me off! You drive a blue BMW this year's model, don't you? What? License plate XYZ PDQ? Uh, yeah? For frivolous waste of 911 operator time, you are removed from the gene pool. <laughs> don't let this happen to you. Make sure your emergency is a real emergency. Wishful thinking, eh? But wishful thinking is the root of good fiction. For more good fiction, check out 19 Nocturne Boulevard at www. 19 Nocturne Boulevard.com. That's 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Well, so, hey, that sounds like something I need to check out, and I would definitely listen to it. Gift of the Zombie. Yeah, well. Now, is it pronounced Gift of the Zombie? It not? is Zombie. That's how they said it. Just like Magi. Vagi. <laughs> Whoa. I didn't say nothing. Well, you know, we've probably talked a long time, I imagine. Too long. Should we just let it go? Yeah, I think we've probably bored people enough. If you have any questions for us, you can leave them in the comments. Well, hey, I had a lot of fun. It's been cool to collaborate with you. 
I don't know that it made us any closer as people, but uh, it was cool to uh, hear your kids say get bent. <laughs> that made it all worth it. Yeah. It was good. Maybe we'll have to do it again sometime. Maybe if we do, we can uh, air it on the uh, show and you guys can uh, see if it gets any better. As always, I have been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. If you don't want to get beat down, just leave the presence and then leave me alone. Good night, folks, and have a merry, merry Christmas. And the other thing. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. We pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. As the coroners took away his filthy stiffening body. That's some dark shit. I love it. <laughs> a moldy old apple core, five double bubble wrappers, a wadded up bag from the dollar store, and several pieces of broken cock. Crockery spilled out. You had to say cock, didn't you? <laughs> Ew, that's on the carpet, dang it. Um, Stuart, let's go downstairs and see if we can find uh, something to uh, do down there. What is going on down there? Oh, God, it's a delicious art. Can do that again? It's the only funny line in that whole movie, isn't it? <laughs> well, you mean Piusa wasn't funny? Okay, fellas, this is Norm Sherman here. I'm, uh, I'm going to do this in a car, actually, and uh, driving down the interstate. Uh, I'm not driving. <laughs> that would be dangerous. But uh, I am in the passenger seat. So if this comes across as KV or cavernous or reverby or like a Honda Civic E, then just let me know, and I, can, uh, I think I can whip this out tomorrow night for you guys if the sound isn't quite there. I'm not sure how it's going to sound. Okay, here goes. The Spirit of Christmas by Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Or Anklevich, depending on where in the world you're from, I guess. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and come clean here, fellas. I might or might not have had a little bit too much to drink, but that's just because we, we stopped at a uh, Ruby Tuesdays and... And that's just because of that reason. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish the lines here, and uh, hopefully you you won't be able to tell. Here we go. Inside, he found his little son, Stuart, up to something as well. There on the top of the piano was the set of blocks that spelled out the word believe. Stuart was artfully rearranging them. He split the blocks in half, shuffling the letters until they spelled the phrase, Be evil. <laughs> That's awesome. It looked like he was pretty sure it was. Yes, it was a piece of the broken plate. We missed one. Zuta lo, I have missed one. Honey, as far as I'm concerned, the spirit of Christmas is you. Is that too cheesy? <laughs> or should I make it more cheesy? No, don't make it more <laughs> cheesy, but can you... Remove the cheese from it, or is it? I can try. Like that?